My name is Grace Cox, but everybody calls me Senora Chela. And um, the reason, I think, was that when I came here, I was married to Dewey Tapp, and uh, my name was Grace Tapp. Tapp is a Prussian name, and the students were saying, uh, Senora, it should be Frau Tapp, you know. And so they're kidding about it, etc. We had a, a Spanish meeting and they said, well, we'll just call you Senora Chela. And that's when it happened at the very beginning because of the last name Tap. Okay. So um, uh, then I came here uh, in um, 1966, when, uh, 67, the year in 66, 67, when uh, the university was, or the college at that time, SOC, was hiring a lot of people. And um, I wasn't going to come. I had uh, other plans. I, w I had my master's from Boulder, Colorado Univ University of Colorado in Boulder. And I was planning on getting my doctorate degree. And I got three offers, very good offers. One was in Seattle, one was in Chicago, and one was in Salamanca in Spain. And um, I, of course, decided Salamanca, Spain. And then, um, Coming here, and the reason I'm mentioning, mentioning this, because it was a, um, my husband, who was very ill at the time, he was a veteran of, of the World War II, et cetera, had a bad heart, and he knew that he didn't have long, you know, and he said, well, you go get your doctorate, because you're going to have to support the kids. I had three boys, and uh, then I'll take care of the kids while you're gone, and et cetera. And as I kept noticing him, I noticed that he was getting weaker, and I said, I can't, I just can't go. Um, I, I have to stay with the kids and with him. So we decided to come here, because uh, SOC was, uh, definitely wanted a person in Spanish and in French. So um, I had taught Spanish and French before, so uh, Dr. Hannon, who was the person who came to Lewis and Clark where I was teaching, said that they needed a Spanish-French teacher, and I was teaching Spanish and French in Lewis and Clark. So um, I came, and I was happy that I did because he died exactly a year later. Just that was it. and. And then I thought, well, it's my time now to go to Salamanca. And I, I, they had said that they would leave the uh, scholarship open to get the doctorate. Because at that time, Spain wasn't open so much to, to receive people from the United States or anyone, because they just didn't have that type of a program. So they, they were looking for US people. And so they held it open for me, not because of me, but that was the, the thing that they were thinking about. And uh, so I called them and I said, I think I'm going to be able to go. And I talked to Dr. Stevenson, who was the president of the university, and he asked me please not to go. And um, because while I was here, apparently the, you know, the attendance, the enrollment had kind of doubled in, in Spanish and in French, and, and so they wanted me to stay, and especially in, in Spanish, and they, they, had, they um, had an opening for another French teacher, and so I was only in Spanish, and uh, I decided that was a big decision because I had to forego my doctorate then and stay because I, I knew that I couldn't go later on with three kids. It was just sort of a, I was frozen in that, that time and that space and that decision. So that's what happened. And um, uh, he said it wouldn't, ma that wouldn't matter to the university here, but asked please if I would stay because I had, spo had spoken about having different exchanges and we had had lovely talks about some academic programs and he rather wanted to see them fulfilled. And so he's, he was very adamant about me staying and, and it's nice to have someone really want you and, and you have the other 
not drawbacks, but the other responsibilities of kids, you know, and what to do. So this was nice. And this, at the time, Ashen was, and still is in its way, but it has changed, an Americana. It was just an American city in the sense that good place to raise kids. Um, you wouldn't, didn't have to worry about it. And uh, it, in the sense that for the first five or almost eight years, Hardly anyone locked their doors in Ashland. We didn't lock our car doors. We didn't, I know, we didn't lock our doors. We'd go anywhere, and, and it was just that safe. It was just really um, a little fairy tale, happy land, you know, and, and uh, uh, there was no lights. For example, on Siskiyou and Mountain, there were no lights there, you know, if you can imagine that, and uh, the traffic wasn't as, as much, and so, it was a, a nice college, SOC, and it was a friendly college. Uh, at the time, I remember the first year I came, the first week, the first day um, that we reported, this was before the students came, of course, the, for a week before, is that the, we had to take the books over to the new library. And every we professors all laughed because we were all of us taking and some professors even brought little uh, red wagons to carry their books in I wish that someone had taken pictures of that I have never seen a picture of the professors carrying the books over I know we had all our language books to take over to the library and um, we did not put them in the shelves that wasn't our responsibility but we did have to take them over and put them in a section and we were all laughing, giggling even, because it was so weird. That was our first job, you know, that we had to do. Um, and then we had our teachers' meetings, our prof faculty professor meetings. And at that time, the school was oriented more towards the faculty. Uh, faculty was separated from staff. Not in a, it, to me, it was not a negative way at all. It was just that that was the way it was. And um, we had our, our faculty meetings, and um, I remember that everyone was teasing me because there weren't many women on the campus at that time, women professors or, or even instructors. Um, and so uh, when I was hired, Dennis Hannon, the professor, was kidding me more than anyone that they used me in three categories. Number one, they wanted representative women more on the college faculty, and I was Hispanic, and uh, I was Indian. My mother is Apache Indian uh, from the Mascalaro uh, uh, tribe, that's the Geronimo's tribe, and um, my father is from Spain, Avila. So therefore, I am what one calls a mestiza, a mixture of two races, you know, et cetera. And um, most of the people in Mexico are mestizos. They're Mexicans, but they're mestizos, the blending of the two races, the European and the Indian race. So they use me in that manner. I don't say use. I don't mean that as a negative sense, but it was interesting. It was kind of funny, and it, it was good for some laughs in some quarters. So um, then that's how it started. And apropos this, while well, I can remember and we're on the, the subject more or less, I was asked informally if I would please be the uh, counselor, sort of someone that would guide and help the uh, Native American people that we had here from the Kalamath Reservation. And there weren't that many, but there were enough for them to be concerned that that they had someone to talk to them, etc. And my duties weren't large in any way, shape, or form, but um, we, I enjoyed it. And, and we did a lot of talking. And this was the time when the Kalamath people were going through that big thing about them selling their land and everybody getting a piece. And uh, 
it, it, it was a topic of, of conversation in many circles throughout the valley, you know, what was happening because people were concerned about what are, we, what are we going to do about water rights and all this type of thing. And the students from there came with these, uh, with these feelings and with these ideas and how would people accept this and what are we going to do. And that was very much on their mind, you know, how would it change their life. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, and another thing apropos that particular situation is that I always liked to get up early in the morning so the department just loved me because nobody wanted to have the eight o'clock classes and I just said hey that's for me I just that's my forte I love I'm wide awake in the morning and so throughout practically my entire career which was from then to 1998 uh-huh. Uh, I took the, any time there was an eight o'clock class, I took it. So, um, and the reason I'm telling you this is that the funny thing, and it, it happened through all the years, that the people that came from Klamath Falls, you know, um, and from California, and from um, Grants Pass, were the students that were always on time. And the students that came from the dorms, they were the ones that had to sneak in the door, you know, at eight o'clock. It was it hap it was just something that's human nature or whatever it is. And I always laughed about it because it was true to form every year, every year. But I love those classes in the morning, and uh, I did get a lot of those lovely students that that were very concerned about their education and would travel through rain and snow and whatnot all the time to to get four years. That four years is a lot of time to do that with all the coming over the mountain and coming through the curse from Klamath Falls, etc. I had great respect for those students and and uh, their motivation. So um, uh, so then then now let's start back. The, uh, so I decided to stay and um, where I had had experience in in Washington, where I was at Lewis and Clark College there, with Sister City in Vancouver, Washington. And the Sister City was Arequipa, Peru, which is another old colonial town in Peru. And so while I was there for two years, I was at the Sister City, and I loved the experience of it and saw the benefit of it, not only for the students, but for uh, the townspeople. Because in those days, this was way before Mount Martin Luther King, not way before, but there, the whole um, Southwest, not California, and not necessarily Washington, Vancouver, yes, because Vancouver was a small little town, but people were very provincial. And so they, the only people that they saw, and I, it was a true here, uh, people from other cultures that they saw, was the international students. And um, I think there was one black student, I can't remember, at least the one that I had acquaintance with, you know, on the campus at that time. Um, so Ashland truly was a provincial town you know, in, in the sense, and they really appreciated the international students. Uh, the community loved the international students because, you know, they had a chance to uh, to talk to them. And, um, and so for that reason, it was good for Ashland. And so I got it in my bonnet when I was here. Well, why don't we start a sister city? And uh, I asked the mayor and and, and uh, Dr. Stevenson, what, you know, what they thought about it. And they said, well, Dr. Stevenson thought he really didn't know about it, but he trusted my judgment and that you'll go ahead, you know, we'll see what we can do. And the mayor and the chamber here said, well, they were looking for a sister city, as a matter of fact, but they were looking for one in England because of the Shakespeare connection. And I thought, okay, well, you know, I simmered on that for a while. And then something extraordinary happened um, that changed my whole life and, and um, was very much responsible for having our sister city. Um, my son at the time, um, I have three sons, and they fit the, the description of this whole Mestizo thing that I'm talking about. The first one uh, is very 
my color more or less with brown eyes and the second one was was born because my father was very blonde with blue eyes from Spain was born blonde hair and very very blue green eyes and the third one was totally Indian very dark but with green eyes okay so there was that mixture this lovely third son was six years old at the time and his father had just died okay this was a year after and so he was ready to enter the first year he went to the little kindergarten preschools that still exists and it's so that's one of the things that still has its charm here and so wonderful that we have that preschool you know the little kindergarten school right here on uh, the Avenue uh, Walker Street so um, he entered first grade in Lincoln School and this was before again the, the Martin Luther King thing the first day of school, uh, two weeks after his father had died, he was a very nervous little kid, and um, he came home in a very bad, after school he came home rather disconcerted, very nervous and crying, and he had a nosebleed, and I asked him what had happened, and he said the kids uh, after school and during recess were um, teasing him, bullying him, calling him names. They didn't know what he was. They called him greaser and spick and everything they could think of and um, pummeled him. So I did this, this, this is not to be. So I went to talk to the teacher and she was a young teacher and she said, you know, I, I caught I was aware of that, not during recess, but after school I saw that and I asked him if I could walk him home. We only lived you know, two blocks from Lincoln School, and he said no and ran home. So she said, I will keep track of it and we'll see what can be done. And um, so he went to school the next day and it was worse. His uh, shirt was torn and so I went to see the principal and I said, I can't have this and he certainly can't have it, and especially at the time that, uh, the time that he was going through. And uh, I said, he, I was going to have to take him and perhaps, uh, you know, uh, take go to St. Mary's School or something in Medford or do something because we had no private school here. There was no charter school, etc. So she was very, very concerned about it and thought that she would talk to the parents, etc. Now this was of a Friday, and so I thought about it over the weekend, and I trying to make arrangements etc and I said you know I'm going to try something okay and luckily for me and for him he was very talented I had our family always sang and dance and he picked up things just like this and he could sing and I taught him some Apache I had taught him some Apache dances and some of the chants I taught him some Spanish uh, little flamenco things and the Mexican hat dance and etc so we always as a family would always do this type of thing the father Dewey Tapp um, was a musician he had played in Denver that's where we were from played with the uh, Denver Symphony and then in the weekends he played with the blacks in in Denver with the jazz band and he was um, very very good and he taught both of the older boys classic guitar and so it was a very musical family all the time so uh, I asked the teacher to go along with me this was my son's teacher in the first grade and would she please allow him to do show and tell and uh, for maybe two or three days so that the students could see that there was something there and he had a background of something and um, so he did and he did uh, the first day I think he did the, the little Mexican hat dance and sang a little uh, Spanish song and then the second day he did some Indian chants and some uh, uh, Apache little drum things and um, the other p teachers heard this and the word started going around and they invited him to their classes and within a week he was the hero of the school and this is just a lesson to show people that you don't have to call victim all the time or make get it from the negative side you know if there's some other way to get around it perhaps you could try it and I I um, was 
very, very pleasantly and and uh, wonderfully surprised, as so were the teachers. And that totally throughout then the rest of his uh, school life here, and he went to all pardon me, to all the schools, went to Lincoln then the junior high, they called it junior high at the time, and to Ashland High School. So he had a wonderful, wonderful career here in, in the school, you know, atmosphere. Ashton was a lovely time. Then the Martin Luther King took, took place and Ashton changed radically, um, or at least if, the, if it wasn't a stable change, it was in theory. And it was more than tolerance then, and they um, started recruiting more diverse people, you know, from the Hispanic and the, um, although the, the Valley had had Hispanic people because of all the workers here, they did not live here in Ashland and the students didn't come to the school. We started getting more Hispanic families in and the diversity rather exploded um, in contrast to what it used to be. So, and that was a very good thing for the college and for the town. And that's what cemented my idea, um, going back to that particular week and seeing what happened, that I thought, well, you know, Ashland doesn't need England <laughs> for a sister city. They need Mexico. You know, and I had traveled in Mexico and I knew just the town because Guanajuato had a university, a thriving university, um, and there were many things that we had in common. And I thought, and having been there, I knew that it was just the thing, you know, that we wanted. So I asked permission from the, our president, Stevenson, and the mayor to go down and try to start a sister city and a sister university. And um, even though it wasn't in my job description, everything was done as a, in a volunteer basis, and the department fully recognized this, and they went along with it, and um, we started. And then in Mexico, in, in Guanajuato, the mayor was all for it, although they had a sister city, but they weren't doing too well. It was Claremont, California. So we decided to become friendship cities for, for a year or so to see how that worked out. And the university was not happy at all. Um, the University of Guanajuato had, during the summertime, they had all of these students coming from the top Ivy schools here. They came from Harvard and, and from Berkeley and et cetera. And these were generally the rich kids. This was in the 60s and they, they went to the scum, summer school in Guanajuato. They had a thriving summer school. And the people did not like them, and the university president did not like them, because this was the time of the hippies. And they were wearing the hippie garb, and Guanajuato at that time was very conservative. Uh, the women were still wearing the black shawls and around them and over their head. The men were wearing the, the hats, etc. cetera. Uh, very, very stylish hats, not Pancho Villa hats, but very, very stylish, beautiful Guanajuato regional hats. And they did not like the fact that the girls were wearing shorts and, you know, doing all the hippie things that take place on the beach, etc. And the rector, their rector means president, was even thinking about dismissing and not having summer school. He thought that they were bad influence <laughs> on the, you know, the students, etc. So, um, uh, I didn't know this till I spoke to him, but I made an appointment with him. And um, he told his secretary that he could only see me for 15 minutes. And um, I said, fine, you know, I, we'll see what happens. And so I, he didn't come. And that was in the morning. And then, so he, the secretary was embarrassed and made an appointment for the afternoon. He didn't show up. So she says, I don't know what's the matter. He's very busy, da, 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 da. And could I please do it in the morning? And I said, well, I'm leaving the following morning. So I hope that I could see him because my university president was very anxious to find out if we could have, pardon me, have a program. So he didn't come. <laughs> and so I found out where he lived. And I thought, I've got to come home with some idea. So I went to his house and I knocked on his door and I, I said, you know, I, 
I don't know if you know me, but we made an appointment for three times, and I know you're very busy, and and I know that you probably couldn't come, and et cetera, but I do need to see you if you could give me time. And he looked at his watch, and he said, I, I can give you 15 minutes. So I went in, and I was there for two hours, and he invited me for dinner, and then we stayed and talked, and I had all the recommendations that Dr. Stevenson had wanted. We wanted a full-blown academic one-year program where our students would go and get credit over there, not, not um, you know, just a flotsam summer tourist credits, etc. Or most of the exchange programs at that time, academic exchange, and that was everywhere. Not all of them, but a majority of them, would send our professors over there with their students. And it would be our professors that would teach them there in that country, which really is not, uh, to, in my way of thinking, it a good exchange, you know. And so we talked over the fact that that this was to be an academic program where our students would go enter all of their classes and not just be in a group where they were taught, you know, uh, uh, cultural things, but if they were, for example, um, uh, want to be a policeman, they would be in that particular study if they wanted to be artists, if they wanted to be, you know, whatever, English, a psychologist, they would go to that school. And Guanajuato is a huge un university with many masters and many doctorate degrees. So we were very fortunate that they went along with this. And so he liked the program. And he said, however, we're going to try it out. So he sent one of his um, department heads, David Guerra. We have the David Guerra, David Guerra, David Guerra tree, uh, because he was a scientist and uh, head of the science department there. When he died, which was four years later, he was killed by a car, uh, the department liked him so much that they planted the David Guerra tree there. Anyway, he came over and he stayed. He loved it, and we were off. It was just a big bang, and we started off sending our students. So, but we started with four, and when I left in 1998, we had 27, that's 27 the year before, I think 31 students just of Spanish exchange students going over. That was more than all of the other people of Oregon put together in their exchange programs. We were a thriving program throughout those years, you know. And it was sort of a two to one. If we sent 30, they would send 15. If we sent, you know, 15, they would send seven, et cetera. And um, it worked. It was just beautiful. And, and um, then uh, I was very much involved in the city. And we had all of our anniversaries. And uh, this last anniversary, we had um, we had our mayor, city council people, uh, judges, doctor, dentist, um, Rotary, Lions. You know, all of these people, Chamber of Commerce, were involved, plus students, uh, and they sent their representatives here. So we just finished our 50th year, not only with exchange of the university, but also with sister cities. So we are sister cities and sister universities. We are the only sister city that has lasted this long with going full force. Most people just send their mayors down or they have sister cities, let's say for and universities for maybe a year or two years and then they die. It's too much work. It's a lot of work, okay? And so they just die off for, for lack of um, anybody wanting to do it, you know? So we were very happy that our university latched on to the program and they helped the students. They, uh, they allowed the students from, from Guanajuato to come in and enter all of their programs, music, art, philosophy, science, psychology, et cetera. And it really was a unique program, totally unique in every way, shape, or form. And it's won international awards because of that. So I'm very proud of the fact that um, the faculty went right along with the program and uh, the the department heads, many of them went to Guanajuato during their sabbaticals, and uh, our administrators did the same thing. Um, uh, 
it, the it just it was all levels you know that that participated in this and made it a success that it is so i was very happy with the outcome there were some problems mm -hmm. early on with Guanajuato relationship. I read letters from parents, letters to the president. Oh, yeah. About students that were in trouble down there. Oh, gosh, yes. Well, you, you know, that's what I'm saying. We, um, I don't call it problems. I call it problematical because we had the same things at, at you know, at Lewis and Clark. I had the same thing at, at, in, in uh, Boulder University. If you don't have problems, you're not growing, you know. And so I, what were the problems? Uh, just kids. Uh, well, one of the pro big problems they didn't want to come home. You know, they wanted to stay there. I had to call the parents would call me up. They really, you know, I want my kid home, and they're blaming it on Mexico. It wasn't Me well, yes, it's Guanajuato's fault. It's so enchanting that the kids want to stay there, but they didn't want to come home. And then we had another big problem that we had to tell them is that um, if you're in Me if you're in Guanajuato and you they have long vacations they have from december the 18th till practically january the 18th and if you're in mexico you're very nuts to come home during that month time you know it's just you could so they would want to go to places like guatemala well you know in the 80s and night you don't go to guatemala and we told them that once you do that we can do nothing for you. I mean, not even the President of the United States. You know, it, that's your choice. And if you're going to be dumb enough to do it, you know, and I gave them very intense um, you know, orientation before they would leave. And also, um, drugs were just coming, you know, Guanajuato's been spared a lot of what's going on around it, even now, okay? Um, and so our kids were told that, um, for example, my son, my eldest son, he went down there and he stayed in Guanajuato. He married a girl from Leon and he was, went to the university program there for two years. And he saw a girl, not one of our students, but our students learned a lesson from this. It was a strong lesson. Uh, she was at a party and she wasn't even doing anything, you know, but the police came and other people were, were smoking pot and et cetera. They put them all in jail. And this was one of the friends of my son's. I don't know where she was from. I think she was from um, California. I don't know. So he went to visit her and other because it was her birthday and her other friends went to visit her. If you're put in jail in Mexico, it's changed in the last four or five years, but at that time, your family had to pay in Guanajuato for your food. You know, it, it was a terrible situation. So then, then going back to the beginning of, of, of SOU, uh, SOC at the time, after Dr. Stevenson left, uh, then we had Dr. Sowers. And of course, everyone said, that was a huge change in every way and it it they didn't say it was for the better or for the worse it was just a huge difference in personalities in styles of running the college and um and everybody was very happy with dr stevenson and with dr sowers um the this the university just just grew as far as faculty is concerned, we got more women in. We tried to go for more diverse, and we would have maybe a black uh, professor in for maybe two years or something or coming in, but they didn't stay. There wasn't that thriving black community here. You know, that they just were not, it doesn't, what they weren't happy, they just didn't feel that comfort zone, you know, and, and they went on to other to other places, but um, we had, um, in our department, we added German and Russian, and we were very happy to do that. And th when I came, I remember my, my office, first office I had was in Central, and then I moved over to the hospital, the old hospital where Stevenson Union stands now. And that was really an experience because it was 
kind of spooky at night, you know. The stairs creaked and the doors creaked, every, all of them, you know, shut them and it, you'd go to work at night and it, it was kind of an exciting experience. And we had, um, and they always said it was haunted, you know, and there were all sorts of stories about it, etc. And uh, our German, to show you the provincial, and I don't use this as any, uh, many people would say that's sort of a, a um, put down, but it was, the faculty was very close, and it was, as I said, it was sort of like family. We all ate together during lunch. Our Stevenson Union did not exist, and we didn't have a regular lunch place, but we all ate in the Brit Ballroom, we called it the Brit, you know, and there was a huge auditorium above, you know, in the Brit, we called it a ballroom where we had dances. and. Um, we were very close. It was nice to be able to talk to people in PE and to talk over the games and nice to talk to people in science and art. It was a family and it was a lovely experience. I tr truly love those beginning. We call them the golden years, you know, the old faculty because we had a wonderful relationship with each other. And then um, the, when they tore down the hospital and built the Stevenson Union, it, it just changed. That was a radical change because then um, they started having lounge rooms, which they didn't have room before, you know, in the in the various buildings. And the faculty went there to eat their lunch, or uh, the the Mexican restaurant started across the street. They started going other places, and we never saw each other except at the big faculty meetings at the beginning and at the end, uh, we'd have some other departmental meetings or, you know, where we all get together, but it wasn't the same thing. There wasn't this camaraderie. And another way to show this lovely type of feeling that we had with each other, our German teacher had a goat, a small goat, and she was pregnant and she would bring the goat and put her underneath her desk up in the old hospital here on the campus and um, because she was afraid that she'd have her baby she was pregnant and then when the baby when the one baby came she brought the baby and put it in a box and etc and took care of it you know that just doesn't go now you know but there would be the hundred laws against it and you know it just wouldn't be but that was the type of soc that we had and i haven't even gotten to sosc okay so i'm sorry i guess i talked too much about a particular thing it was a lot of fun and uh then not only did the faculty change as far as not having this wonderful opportunity to eat with each other and share, um, I'm telling the entire faculty, of course we had wonderful departmental meetings, but the, the staff, it was good, it, it, had, it had sort of a good, bad situation there. Um, Dr. Cox came after Dr. Sowers and he changed the idea of instead of just introducing when the faculty came in September, that the staff would come and all the new staff would be introduced along with the new faculty. And that was, even though we lost the camaraderie of the other, that was a plus for everyone. We truly had the opportunity to talk and to mingle and to welcome the staff as well as the new professors, which I thought was a big step I don't know if it was forward, it just was nice. We really liked it because we felt sort of uh, not, not as close as we were before, but at least it gave that feeling that we are a close universities because um, I'm sure big universities just don't have that. I taught at the in Boulder University, you know, and I was there as an instructor of two years and they didn't have any of that. So I loved the feeling that SOC and SOSC had as concerns the faculty and the staff. It was something that you just don't find in bigger universities. And thank heaven for the, um, the uh, presidents that we had that would allow and had the vision, you know, to see this. And that also had the vision to understand the sister city, sister university concept that they all, every one of them, um, 
truly imbibed in to the fullest. Uh, the, um, they would even have some of the Guanajuato people for an entire year in their homes, you know, and really welcomed them. And it was a wonderful experience. I started uh, directing the international plays then, and that was that changed my life again. Not only the Guanajuato experience, but directing the, the international students was just absolutely a, a learning experience to the nth degree, not in the, the duties, you know, uh, that I was supposed to do, but it was volunteer and, and out of the regular academic uh, situation. And I learned so much from those people. We had all of those countries, and I had an opportunity to direct them. And at that time, the international show was very classical. The, the, all, I loved that the students did all of the old-fashioned, the traditional dances and songs. And if they didn't know them, I taught them the, the song, because I did a folk dancing of all of these different things, and I, I knew a lot of songs from different regions, etc. cetera. Um, and the, the personalities were just, just fabulous. We'd have practices at 7 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock at night, you know, and uh, we practice up in the Brit Ballroom, and then, uh, then we changed, and etc. The, the whole it was a constant changing, but the students had, um, for example, you have the Japanese students. You tell them to be there at seven o'clock, let's say in the evening to practice. They'd come at six o'clock, and they'd be all ready to go, and they'd know what was going to do. And you would just, you know, help them with staging, and you know, change a few things, and etc. And um, the Mexicans, you'd have them come at seven o'clock, they'd come at eight o'clock, okay? You know, it, was, it just happened every year, and so you just, you know, would try to up the time on them. But it, it was a wonderful thing to, when, when the Arab students came, that, that changed a lot. Um, there were a lot of things going on, as you know, in the 80s, et cetera, with the whole Arab situation. It helped our professors to understand a lot of what was going on in the world. I think that our Guanajuato program helped with the diversity and learning more about the Mexican culture and these very sophisticated um, Mexican people that came that had, where we have our Shakespeare, they have the Cervantes, and they're, it's, a, it's the most, what should I say, um, uh, advanced city in all of Mexico to have all of the, the your ballet and your opera, the festival from all over the world. They'd get the Bolshoi Ballet, they'd get the New York Philharmonic in there for the Cervantes Festival, they'd have the, the, the um, Shakespeare from London, you know, the, it just uh, incredible what they had and they would come and bring a lot of that here, you know, and we would be privy to that or we would go to Guanajuato. But when the Arabs started coming in, uh, to, ch to finish that idea, so that helped our faculty a lot, you know, to become interested in this diverse culture. And then when the, uh, the Middle East people start coming in, that was another change for our faculty and was very important. It was very good for the faculty uh, in that they were able to discuss from a student's point of view, these were passionate Arab uh, from your, uh, Yemen and Jordan and Arabia and Iraq, just everywhere. And even, the, even they, amongst themselves, had some conflict. So we could see that, faculty could see that. But they, they did you know, stick together here. But it was interesting to talk to them and to educate the faculty of what was going on you know, in that part of the world. Uh, we needed that. We needed Guanajuato. Uh, uh, it just helped the whole community you know, to to enter more into the, that what they talk about. You know, many times Ashram people can can talk the talk, but they don't have the opportunity to walk the walk. It isn't that they don't want to, they just don't have the opportunity. And with these people coming in and talking to us and sharing and lifting the awareness and the consciousness, you know, was very important, I think, at that time. So uh, directing the students, I learned a lot. Um, 
I was there uh, directing one of the Hawaiians, for example. Remember when Hawaii wanted to, you know, back away from being part of the states, etc. Uh, I was privy to all of that and the students and what was going on in their country. So we learned a lot, you know, from, from and I remember that the Hawaiians wanted to um, uh, put some of their po politics, you know, and do something like that and incorporate. And I said, no, we don't have religion and we don't have politics, you know, in this show. And they were very adamant about it. And so I had to take them aside and talk to them, you know, because they felt that, that uh, Ashland just didn't know anything and they were going to, to tell Ashland what it was all about, except they, they were, there were a lot of activists in that particular year. So what we saw from the students coming in from the different countries was what was happening in their country. Um, and the reason I can say this is because I was involved in all of that, aside from my academic job, which I haven't even gotten into, you know, telling you about. So, and, and the, how the academics change with the different rectors, you know, and the, the paths that they took. So I'm sorry I didn't get into SOSC or to SOU and what happened and what we did and how we did it and how we had our lovely talks about it and how it, um, the pros and the cons, you know, of this whole thing. So that was a, a it was uh, a growth process for the faculty, especially those of us that had been there at the SOC, SOSC, you know, SOU time. Um, we grew along with all the things that were happening. And I can safely say that the, that the faculty was inspired and educated and made more aware of this because of the international students, you know, and all of this taking place. Um, and I, I just truly appreciated the vision of all of our, uh, rec our presidents of the university that came in, that latched on to the sister city, you could see the, the, the worth of it, and, and tried to help always the international students, all of them went overboard to, to participate and, uh, and also to see what was happening with the Klamath, you know, the Native American, the Hispanics, the faculty truly, of course, I was younger at SOU and I couldn't see all of that there. And of course, Denver and Boulder are just a, a melting pot. So they had, they could walk the walk all the time, you know. And we were constantly here in a learning period, you understand? I really admire the faculty for doing that and for having fun, you know, and learning and going through all the pain also uh, um, and the pain and the pleasure, you know, of, of being part of a, um, of a small college and all that that means, you know, especially as we're trying to enter into a more diverse commu community. Can you tell me a little bit more about the old hospital? Did oh, it look like a hospital? Yeah, well, it looked like an old hospital. It looked just like, oh, were there classrooms yeah, it was wooden, classrooms? it was wooden and it was creaky and it was, um, you know, those old, um, it's just like you see in the movies, it just looked like a big, wooden house a huge big wooden house and it but the but the stairs were beautiful oak you know just old 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 wood um it was it was lovely inside but was there a basement? yeah there was a basement and there were, i think there were two big floors but there was a third kind of warehouse floor and basement was more for machines i guess um, and we, they cleared all that out, but we could see some machines downstairs. And the, it was wonderful because, you know, where you have special rooms for patients, those are smaller rooms, that was the, our offices. It would just work just perfectly. Um, and then they would open two or three of the, just like you have big hospital rooms where people that don't have a lot of money and maybe 10 people, that was perfect for a classroom. So they really didn't have to do too much renovation, you know. Because it was a and dorm before it was a Yes, yes, uh-huh. Right? So it, it just, uh, it served a lot of purposes, but it was getting dangerous, you know. It, um, one of the steps just caved in one of the times that I was going up the steps, you know. 
and it it wasn't safe. It 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 was a fire hazard to the nth degree, you know. So um, that's according to our standards today, you know. According to their st anything was a fire hazard yeah. according to our standards today. But it was a lot of fun. Um, the last thing I wanted to ask, and it, we don't really have any time left, but the what is about uh, Betty Lou Dunlop? Can you talk about Betty Lou? Um, and, and well, she um, you know. Um, there were, how do I go to say that, there were other women professors and instructors after her in the PE department, but she stood out because... Betty Lou was in education. Education, I know, but uh, in education, but she, she had a lot of friends in the PE because we had women PE instructors, okay. What? Beth Bennett. Yes, uh-huh. And um, she stood out, I think, among all the rest of the women faculty. She had an aura about her that was, um, she could get in and have a lot of fun, but there was always this thing that, that of her own person, of her own persona, that most people don't achieve. She could get in and have a lot of fun and yet she could be a, a command a lot of respect the men respected her the women respected her and um, she was called upon to uh, even amongst a lot of the men at that time to to lead whatever they were doing you know to uh, I remember that there was a a thing about going joining the union you know and things like that she was one of the um, she was a type that, you know, would just kind of lead, but not in an activist. She could get things done without being an activist, do you know what I mean? And um, she just commanded that respect. She spoke slowly, and she said what she meant. She didn't go overboard and just rattle on and on and on, you know. I, did I, she advocate for the union? Did she advocate for what? For the union? I don't remember what she did. No, I don't think she did. But she calmed. She had. She calmed a lot of spirits down, you know. And I, I had a role in that too. Um, and um, remember the Order of the Purple Girdle? Did you go to any of those? Yeah. No, well, you know that was the year that they disbanded it. What year was that? That was nineteen. Well, the year that I came. 1969. Yeah. They. I, I had think. Records through 1969. 1969. Well, the, then they did it on their own, you know, because when Dr. Sowers came, the, uh, the faculty women, um, they yeah, the they did, lives. they just, well, okay, when Dr. Sowers came, he, he wanted the faculty to be more academic, not so, now, he never said that in so many words, but there was something about him that demanded that. He was an Ivy League person. Stevenson was not. And, you know, enough said. You know, you, you, the faculty just catered to that particular type of personality. And, of course, that would not work with Dr. Sowers or Mrs. Sowers' personality. I don't mean to be negative about that, because it wasn't negative. It just happened. Yeah. And so these other things were taking place, but certainly not in, out in the open. And it was sort of like, you know. So uh, maybe by that time, it, it wasn't needed. As no, it, it wasn't needed. Uh -huh. yeah. And you know, when I came, we had all of the new faculty. And the next year also, new faculty was coming by the droves, which was very odd for SOC. And so all of these wives of the faculty people and the faculty had different ideas. It was a whole new generation, just like I don't fit in now to a lot of things, you know, that um, uh, we even, my generation, we even disliked when we used to come here to the gym and register. We loved that. We'd get all of our students coming, and we'd yell over and, and let's say to the um, art department, hey, you know, 
I have a student here that's an art major, but an, a Spanish minor. Come on over and let's talk about that. It was so wonderful to be able to, in that day, you know, just go and help each other out and help the student out. And uh, the student really felt that they were getting attention because you could just say, okay, now you're in psychology and Spanish. This is going to work out beautiful. When you know. did that end? What? When did that peer era end? I would say that that ended about, oh, we had about eight years of that. Was that with Dr. Sowers? Yeah, pro probably the end of Sowers, you know, uh, going toward the end because we didn't want it to end, you know. I, I remember coming back with our bus from, bus from Guanajuato, and we were a little bit late. And so we parked the bus right here in front of the, the gym, and all the kids came out with their sombreros and their sarapis, and they registered, you know, with all their suntans and, you know, and et cetera. It was a very, so then when we had to change and do the computer thing, you know, it just changed. And the people never really got to see, now they go to see a counselor, they never really see the head of their department you know, to talk about them and et cetera. And we fought against that. But you can't fight against progress, okay? And um, and you can tell when you're not part of this, the whole thing. And then when they started having, um, I hated the fact that people in my department, well, we had to have office hours. And I'm a people, I'm a person, people person to the nth degree. And I loved having those, those hours with my students, you know. But a couple of other people didn't and they went to the computer and, uh, you know, they'd have, the, that was their thing, you know, et cetera. So we're all fogies now, you know. But I still have a person-to-person -person relationship. I like to look someone in the eye, you know, and et cetera. So. Betty Lou Dunlop and, and Beth Bennett, mm -hmm. the United Foundation Trust. Do you remember those words, the United Foundation Trust? Um, Do you remember it more like a group of social women yeah. or a group of... No, I remember, no, the garter was definitely social. The women got together and the, both of them were leaders. The, these are powerful women. I just thoroughly respected them and I just loved them to pieces.